Please rise as the light of Christ enters the church. something else on Labor Day weekend. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord because that's where we ought to be. Memorial Day. Memorial Day. I'm calendar challenged. You know that. Memorial Day. It's, and it says right here, Memorial Day. I get those too confused all the time. At least you know today is Sunday. Exactly. So. Man, you know what? I might be worn out. <laughs> it's alright. I know you do that just to test me. Alright. So, there you go. Some announcements this morning. Wednesday night fellowship is out for the summer. People are going to be off doing things and doing summer stuff. The kids are all running wild. You'll be chasing them around and there are just things going on. So Wednesday night fellowship is out for the summer. Men's breakfast is the first Saturday. That's this Saturday. Look at that. I do good because they put it in here. And uh, come out. That's at 8.30. Come out, man. We'll have bacon and sausage and eggs and biscuits and fellowship and... Man, it'll be a good time. Come out, it's always a, a big deal. Church breakfast is the Sunday following that. That would be in two weeks' time. You wrote that down too, so that's great for me. And think VBS. At the beginning of the uh, bulletin here, see if I was reading those, say, remember those who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom because it is Memorial Day weekend. And I'm going to take a, I think they call this in Robert's Rules of Order, I'm going to take a point of privilege here. I, uh, on, on days like this, I like to read something about those who are faithful. And for those of you who were here when I gave the devotion this morning, it was about faithfulness. But you know, a lot of people from think the people from New York are just, I don't know what the right word is for it, but they don't think much of it. But I want, I want to read something here about this guy. He's a Medal of Honor winner. His name is uh, Charles N. DeGlopper, and he was from uh, New York, from Grand Island, New York. And he was... Uh, issued the Medal of Honor for his, what he did in World War II in, in Normandy. In Normandy, this is the big 75th anniversary coming up in the summer of the Normandy invasion. I want to read something about this guy. It says, he was a member of Company C, the 325th Glider Infantry, and on 9 July 1944, advancing with the forward platoon to secure a bridgehead across the Meridot River in La Faire, France. At dawn, the platoon had penetrated an outer line of machine guns and riflemen, but in so doing became cut off from the rest of the company. Vastly superior forces began decimation of the stricken unit and put in motion a flanking maneuver which would have completely exposed the American platoon in a shallow roadside ditch where it had taken cover. Detecting this danger, PFC de Glopper volunteered to support his comrades by fire from his automatic rifle while they attempted a withdrawal through a break in a hedgerow 40 year yards to the rear. Scorning a concentration of enemy automatic weapons fire, he walked from the ditch onto the road in full view of the Germans and sprayed the hostile position with assault fire. He was wounded, but continued firing. Struck again, he started to fall, yet his grim determination and valiant fighting spirit could not be broken. Kneeling in the roadway, weakened by his grievous wounds, he leveled his heavy weapon against the enemy and fired burst after burst until killed outright. He was successful in drawing the enemy action away from his fellow soldiers who continued the fight from a more advantageous position and established the first bridgehead over the Meridot. In this area where he made his intrepid stand, his comrades later found the ground strewn with dead Germans and many machine guns and automatic weapons, which he had knocked out of action. PFC de Glopper's gallant sacrifice and unflinching heroism while facing unsurmountable odds were in great measure responsible for a highly important tactical victory in the Normandy campaign. You know, man, people like that just made things happen. Today, people flinch at doing service for all kinds of small, silly things. And, you know, the faithfulness of the soldiers in the past, the faithfulness of Christ is what we need to just monitor and try and reflect in our own lives, being faithful. And thank God for people like PFC de Glopper, man. They just are what made... America great is just the dedication. Sometimes man, you can't read stuff like that without tearing up. So uh, that, that is great. And let us remember what Memorial Day is all about. Is it a day off? 
Shoot, yeah, when we barbecue, you bet we can barbecue, but we need to remember those who uh, kept us free. Amen? Amen. 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 Where was that at? I don't know. Oh, birthdays. We're going to sing in some birthdays, I think. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. So I'll get you highway hymnals and turn to page number 14.
the full armor of God as he goes and faces what he's going to face here this next week. Um, all of them, they're doing that. Huh? Unspoken. Unspoken. All right. If that's not it, okay. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time here this morning, and you know we just we're blessed. We we don't realize that sometimes we we uh, can't see your will at all times because we don't look for it mainly. But we ask you, Lord, just to bless this little church and continue us on down the path. We thank you for the signs of life I've seen lately. I've seen some some great moves of the Spirit at times, and I just thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I ask you to bless all those in the hospital. we got some that are kind of moving around this week. Get them home safe and, and hopefully get back to some sort of normal schedule for them. And Lord, just bless them and help them know that you're with them. And all the others that can't be here for whatever reason, visiting family, give them traveling mercies. Be with them as they go where all places they go and get them home safe, Lord. And just, Lord, we ask that you would also, those that haven't been here in a while, that you would touch their hearts and help them understand that they really need to be in fellowship with their brothers and sisters in Christ. And Thank you, Lord, for that, that fellowship that I have with these people that are here today. Lord, bless this church. Bless all that we do, Lord, to your will. And now let us say together the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Start at page number one. Let's take the first, second, and stand on the last part of the <laughs> Thank you for all things you've given us. And I just ask you, Lord, that you 
Remind us of who gave it to us and where it came from and all good things come from you. And now we just return those gifts to you and we thank you, Lord, and we ask that you bless them and see them, multiply them as you see fit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
case y'all didn't know who that was. Anybody know who that was? I know that guy. Yeah, that guy sitting right over there. Anyway, awesome job there. So, for the first time in two, three, five and a half years, I preached a sermon twice. Used to do it all the time. Did it four, did it four and a half years in Louisiana, but this first time I, I practiced on those four people. And four, <laughs> trying not to kill them, you know. But anyway, we've been talking through the Book of Romans, and probably I'll just have a moment of review. When you when you think about what we were we've been on this book a while, but it starts off with what just, it talks a lot about sin. I mean, it really talks about where we are. And talks about how we need salvation. Paul just hammers that, how bad we need salvation. But then he, he kind of switches points and he starts talking about the benefits of salvation. You know, what, what do you get for being saved? And uh, and particularly like when you get in chapter 8, we talked about this last week and the week before, talked about no condemnation. That's a big deal. We have no condemnation. But I'll, let's get our verse out of the way here. This is kind of the whole point of the day. And that song was perfect because we're waiting on glory. We're waiting on, on Jesus to come in the air. We're waiting, and of course, we shouldn't just wait. We're supposed to do, right? We're not supposed to just sit on the couch. We're supposed to be active. But He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The word of God to the people of God. Praise be to God. And so we talked about three weeks ago Holy Spirit equals no condemnation. Last week, we said Holy Spirit equals peace. And then now this week, we're going to say Holy Spirit equals glory. And I'm, I, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about, I guess you'd say, the past today. How many of you can remember a time when things were better? I don't care what you talk about. I mean, you can pick any topic. I mean, uh, matter of fact, the cars on my shirt or from a better time, as far as cars go. I'm just thinking that's my opinion, but there was a time when, you know, this country was in a different place. There was a time when the Methodist Church was in a different place. There was a, there was a time when pe how people lived was so much different. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that technology has made our lives better in the spiritual sense. Do you, you, can you feel that? I mean, do you understand that? I mean, all of the things that we have today don't necessarily help us to live better lives in the sense of a relationship with God. Matter of fact, most of them are distracting, aren't they? Most of the things. So I think all of us can remember, you know, quote unquote, glory days, change slides. Anyway, so, but the thing that we need to understand is God has glory days planned for us ahead. That's the most important thing we understand. There's a time will come when we'll be in glory. And we're going to talk about that today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the your word. I mean, there's, there's, there, it, it all begins with that. Our faith comes from that. Our change comes from that. Walking in the Spirit comes from just being a part of the word and in your lives every day. And just, Lord, help us to seek your word and to live your word and tell your word and spread it to everyone, Lord. Help us to understand the words in it. Give us the wisdom. Give us the will to live it. I just ask you this morning, Lord, to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, when you think about those glory days, and I, I don't know, you know, you might have been a star football player, maybe it was high school, or I, I don't know. Everybody has probably a different idea of what that is. But, you know, we talk about our country. Uh, most uh, free democracies like ours don't make it more than 200 years before they fall apart. And so we're... We've made it beyond that bubble, but boy, we've got a lot of things going on right now. There's a whole lot of people arguing about things, and a lot of people want to change the socialism. Good grief, I never thought I'd hear that in my lifetime. Back up 40 years and and uh, think about what would have happened if you had said that then. You'd have been taken out of town on a rail, you know? So I just, I, there's a lot of things going on that I think. And basically, the other day I had a sermon, and part of my sermon I said, the day you're born is probably the best state you'll ever be in because you're born into a world of sin and you're going to decay from there forward. I mean, and, then, and that goes for the founding of our country. That goes for the founding of, of any particular church, denomination. 
it's always going to start here, and unless God is in it all the way, it's going to start to fail. And we talked about that in our bodies last week, how we have these fleshly bodies that are uh, that are they're decaying. They're, you know, we have to deal with sin and death and cancer and all the problems of this world, and it, it's always going down. But there's a promise. There's a promise in Scripture of glory days, better days, new glorified body, a new heaven, a new earth, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I, uh, I want to go back a little bit and, and go uh, all the way back to Genesis 1, the very beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. By the way, that's the first mention of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. It made it all the way to verse 2. It was already there. God's Spirit was already there, starting to work on the world, starting to, to be involved. In verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and that it was good. Now, I'm a, I want to come up with two talk about two principles. Did God get to the third day and say, you know what, I'll take a couple days off? Or did he finish his creation? Did he, did he do, does God finish what he starts? That's my first question. Second thing is, everything God did was what? Good, right? Everything he created, everything was perfect. And then man got involved. Adam shows up. And the, the part of this series and the part particularly of Romans 8, the last half, there are three different, I guess you'd say, characters in the story, and they're all groaning for glory. And, and the first one is that creation is groaning for glory. The second is that we are groaning for glory. And the third is the Spirit itself is groaning for glory. And so Adam creates a situation where everything falls apart. And if you don't believe it, that it was his fault, I say that every time I say it's Eve's fault, I get in trouble, so I'm not going to do that. But um, in verse 16, it says, of chapter 3 of Genesis, To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then Adam, he said, because you have needed the voice of, have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Okay, you hear that? All of planet Earth is cursed because of who? Adam. Because of Adam. We don't think about the Earth and all its problems and all the things. Like, we're going to have a flood like later this week in Arkansas because it's coming down the river and it's already starting to happen in some places. That's one of those things. That's in that list of curses of the planet Earth. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. There's the idea that there were no weeds before this. You got that? Everything was perfect. I think there weren't any fire ants either, I'm just saying. I'm just, I'm just saying. Anyway. But all of you shall eat of the herb of the field, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Also, Adam and Eve, I believe, had eternal bodies, eternal life. They had perfect, these bodies that we don't know about, these glorified bodies that we're going to get, these bodies that never fail, never get sick, never die. I think they had those until he blew it. The world, their world was perfect until he blew it. I mean, it all, it all came apart, so much more than we understand. We probably will never fully understand what Adam's sin did to planet Earth and everything in it. But, but that's why we have Romans. Help us understand. But in Romans 8, starting at verse 17, and if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, hang on, before I do that, I'm going to go back to Isaiah. I want to share something. In Isaiah, there's the more of this. It's throughout the Bible. You'll find plenty of places where, you talk, where God talks about new heaven and new earth, basically replacing the creation we know. But we also find places throughout the Old Testament, tons of places where there's this idea that this one man and his sin and all the people have caused what's wrong with planet Earth today. Verse 4 of uh, Isaiah 24. 
the earth mourns and fades away, the world languishes and fades away, the haughty people of the earth languish, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. Did you get that? Because they broke the laws. And they changed the covenant. They rewrote the rules how they wanted them to be. And therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and a few men are left. I think that probably means there's a few good men left. But, so there's this idea of, of so much more than we think about when we think about what Adam did. We think about we're all born into sin, and yes, we have these bodies that are decaying, and we deal with all that, but there's so much more to it than, than just that one piece. But in verse 17, chapter 8 of Romans, it says, And if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, then we may be glorified together. So there's this, there's this idea that we're going to have a body like his. And the only place we really see this in Scripture is on the Mount of Transfiguration when, you, when he kind of he has his glow. And, you know, we're going to have a body like that someday, people. Do you understand? This, this, old, this, this stuff is going to get a whole lot better. And uh, we're going to be glowing all the time. And there'll be no more pain or suffering. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What kind of sufferings do we have today? Physical, right? Spiritual. We fight. We fight battles. We got, but we do have this Holy Spirit inside of us to guide us. Like I said before, it's like the Swiss Army knife. It, it does everything for us. It keeps tries to keep us on the path. We still struggle with that sometimes. We still battle this flesh that we live in. This body that we have is constantly battling with until we die and go to heaven. We're going to battle that flesh. We're going to battle that body. We're going to battle the lust of the world. We're going to battle all those things. But the Holy Spirit. If you just tap into that, if you read your word, if you pray, if you live into that spirit, it can overcome those things. And that's God, that's God's goal for your life. That's the Holy Spirit is literally a down payment on glory. Did you get that? It's a down payment on what's coming. It's it's God's way of saying, Here, I'm in you, we're in this together, and I got a place for you in heaven. I'm planning on taking you there. Kind of goes with that song. Who are we gonna see? Jesus in the air. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Sons of God. What that saying is, they had Adam and Eve, and things were perfect, and the earth was perfect, and everything was good. Creation is waiting to the day when we all are changed. The earth, planet Earth, is waiting for our change because until we change as a planet, until the whole, all of creation comes to know Jesus Christ or the end of times and those that don't, I get it, but, but until we are transformed, the world cannot be transformed. I hate to say it, it's almost like creation doesn't trust people because of what happened with Adam and Eve and it all fell apart. But a new heaven and a new earth will come after we get our new bodies. It'll all be glory. I mean, everything about it will be glory. There, there's, and it's impossible for me to put in my little feeble human words what it'll be like, but we have some ideas. Verse 20 says, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because, but because of him who subjected it in hope. God subjects us to things, and he subjected planet Earth to things to guide us, to bring us back into obedience. We, we struggle with that. We don't want to be made obedient. We don't want to deal with all the hard things. But God's saying that when Adam sinned, he subjected the creation, all of Earth, to things that he had never seen before. And most of it not good. And because the creation, verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. So once we're delivered, guess what? Planet Earth is delivered. Now, we've got a lot of people who worry about the environment and those kind of things. But I'm telling you, one day, God's going to do the ultimate recycle job. It's all going to be brand new. It's all going to be amazing. It'll be a brand new planet, brand new earth, brand new heavens. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. So creation is groaning to get back to where it was, to get back to where it was perfect, to get back to the Garden of Eden. It's interesting, it uses the word birth pains. I don't know of any other type of pain that has a positive tie to it, right? I mean, it's a new birth, it's a new thing. 
mothers remember their labor pains and probably remind their children of that sometimes. But anyway, but I'm just saying that is a, the only positive pain that you can think of, right? And that's the only thing I can ever imagine a reason why pain, other than the pain that God puts in our lives so that we would straighten up sometimes. Verse 23, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even our, ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now, last week we talked about we were adopted because we became children of God. We got the Holy Spirit in us. Now, this is that promise of a new body. This is God adopting this old dead body. But guess what? Till we leave this place, we don't get to get rid of it. We gotta wear it, we gotta deal with it, we gotta fight it basically and survive. Verse 24, for we were saved in this hope, but we but we hope, but we hope that it's seen is not hope. But the hope that it's seen is not hope, but for those for why does one still hope for what he sees? Everything we live, everything we do, if we're a Christian and we got the Spirit in us, is basically trusting in something in the future, right? It's trusting in something we cannot see. It is hope. And that hope is in this glory. This, this whole few verses here is talking about a world that's fallen apart. Can you tell me anything that you know of that has continued to be perfect or holy or on a good path for many, many years? I mean, anything. I don't care what it is. Most all of you will point to a time in the past when something was better. I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of anything that's better today. It, maybe you all can. I, don't, I can't. There's nothing I can think of that is better today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Yes, we have better, better medical care, right? What else? Can, I mean, I, I can't, there's, there's, the list is very short. When, when you think about um, how the church was such a vibrant part of people's lives in early America and how the church reached out and was the one that would, took care of everyone, the church was the community. The church was the place you socialized. The church was the thing, the one who built the barn together, the one who built the community together. The church was the source of news. The pastor was the one that shared what he knew with everybody. The church was life. The church is not that anymore. Not like that. Not tied, intertwined with their lives in every way and every fashion. A baptism was the be-all, end-all for the community. That would be like the biggest party you could ever have. I'm talking about the glory days that don't exist anymore. But there are glory days coming. There are some amazing glory days coming because of the trust. Because of the trust. You've got trust in God. Trust in Jesus. And most of all, trust in that Holy Spirit living inside you. Because if you don't do that, there is no hope. Your hope comes from that down payment that God put in your heart. That down payment of a better day, a better life. A down payment of total healing. Now, yes, he can do that right now. He surely can. He can heal us right now in this space. But if he does, it's to his glory and his will. We're not in control. It is so he can use us a little further down the road. It's so he can use us for an example. I think of all the times in Scripture where God used the least likely to do the most amazing things. To show that it was him. That's how he works. He uses normal, everyday people who trust in him. I mean, trust and have hope in the future. Understanding that glory. Larry's, Larry's song is all about the ultimate glory days. Now, are you ready for him to come riding in the sky? Are you? I mean, that, that's a legitimate question. Are you ready for him to come in the clouds? Because guess what? It's good news for some folks. Not so good for everybody else. We, you know... I always talk about, I mean, I like preaching Revelation. I like talking about the end times. I think it's awesome. I think we're in the end times. I'm very excited about that. But I also know that I drive on Little Rock every day. I get killed any minute. I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go? Because waiting on the signs in the heavens and all that is pretty silly. Like, it's like that Hail Mary pass in the last second football game going to win. I'd rather have a better track record than that when I go before the Lord. Like me and Larry talk about sometimes. We're going to have this long wagon full of sins that we have to take in there with us and explain, you know, you got this big old, you know. But there's no condemnation in it, is there? We got all those sins, we did all those things, and we do have to explain ourselves. But we're not going to be condemned for them. 
Our slate's clean. Our clothes are white. We're perfect. We're lambs just like Jesus. And we are meant to be there. You've got to remember the hope. The hope is what we live for. Find my verse now. Verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly await for it with perseverance. And that's where we persevere. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit prays for you on your behalf every day? Every day. He intercedes for you. He looks at your life. Looks at what your prayer should be to live into God's will. And he prays into God's will for your life. That's why it's so important of how you study in Scripture, how you live your life, prayer, fasting, and all those things. Empower the Holy Spirit inside of you. And we take it for granted. I'd be very honest. If we, we can truly grieve the Holy Spirit, we can truly almost disaffiliate from with him because we live a life that's so opposite of that and that's why you'll struggle when you do that but there is a guide inside of you a guide that, that loves you cares about you immensely wants you to succeed in God's kingdom and do his will and, and to be a glorious person before God because that that's inside of you is perfect but this old fleshly body that wants to fight it it's not so much it wants to fight it'll fight you the rest of your life and verse 27, now he who searches the hearts knows what the, kind, what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the, the Spirit prays the will for you. What's bad is, guess what? Sometimes we don't want God's will, do we? His will doesn't align with ours. We don't want to follow his pattern. We don't want to follow his lead. But all the time, the Holy Spirit, that's where this battle comes from. We want to do this. Holy Spirit wants us to do that. And all the time, the Holy Spirit's praying for us to do that to God, and we're over here trying to do this. And it all just falls apart. Because it's, it, you're gonna, it's like banging your head against the wall. I know, I do it all the time. Verse 28. And now, and we know all that, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. People love to quote that verse. All things, what did I just say a minute ago? Holy Spirit's praying you do God's will. Holy Spirit's wanting you to go this way. And God says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. So if you're following His purpose, if you're going this way, it's all good. You've got Spirit all over you. You do all kinds of amazing things. You're not stoppable. But while that's going that way, and you're trying to go this way, it don't work so good. That power of the Spirit you can do all those crazy things that people can do in the power of the Spirit, like get up in front and talk to you guys every week. That's pretty simple. Everybody says, well, that's easy. Well, just come up here and do it. You it's easy. Or go out and deal with all the problems of this world, pray for people, watch people get healed, watch people get saved, all those things the Holy Spirit can do, the things we understand the Holy Spirit can do. But all that is living into God's will, listening to that Spirit, quit fighting it. Because it tells you, it knocks on your head, it does on mine, which is where my hair went. But anyway, he, he wears me out. Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What does it say in Scripture? Before we were ever born, God knew us, didn't he? He had a plan for our lives. He had a destiny for who we are supposed to be. Here we go again. Are you walking into that destiny? Are you listening to his will? Are you letting him bless his life, your life? Or are you still trying to go this way? Are you trying to take the easy road? So guess what? That road ain't easy. If God wants your attention, he will get it. I think see people all the time fight God. Totally fight what he's trying to do in their lives. And, then, and, and I've actually seen people that were so blessed. Living the right life, doing the right things. And I'm not saying that, that all, that's all that matters. Because it matters is what you believe. It matters that you. But God is always, always look for obedience. Every Old Testament story that you listen to, the people who were able to succeed in whatever they were trying to do, 
were being obedient to God. Those people that were not, they wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. They were in slavery in Egypt. They, were, they had all kinds of things happen to them. When you're not obedient to God, things don't go well. Things, and God has a way of using those that he's called to do his will, to do his purposes. And once he's called you, he puts that down payment of the Holy Spirit in you. And he, and he wants to justify you. He wants to sanctify you. He wants to have you in glory. He wants you to have a glorified body. He wants you in heaven. He wants, he's adopted you. You're a part of his family. God does not disown the scripture that actually says that. He does not disown his own. We are his. We are grafted in. We were added later, but yes, we're just counting just like we're, we're more than conquerors. Verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. God is working on us always. And he's trying to take us from point A to point B. And it's a, it's a process. One of the questions they ask Methodist pastors when they ordain them is, are you going on to perfection? There's this idea that we're sitting here, God's working on us, His Holy Spirit's working on us, and every day we make one step closer. One day, we, every day we make one step closer. Now, if you're like me, you probably make two steps closer and one step back. That's more my speed than the other way. But the point is you're constantly moving toward the goal that God has put on your heart. The point is that, that, that your, your glorified body, and I want a really fancy one, by the way, if I can have one. Some looks like these bodies. I like these car bodies. They're awesome. But I mean, the glorified body to give us, he gives us, is the goal. And this flesh, this thing that we live in, I know I talk bad about it, but it's what we ache and pain every morning. It's what drives us crazy. We get out of bed, we hurt, we watch the people in the news, and we see all the hateful things we do to each other, and we watch suffering, and we wonder, well, how could God let all that happen? Because we have to look at it from perspective. It's temporary. All of that is temporary. Where we're headed, what's next, is perfect. There is no pain. There is no suffering. There is no anything that's less than perfect. And we, we are called to into that glory. Whether we accept it or not, God wants everyone to meet him there and be a part of that family. I just pray that all of you understand that, that he loves you that much. That he sent his son to die on a cross and to forgive you and make you a no condemnation person. And, and tell me that's not good. Is it good that you're not condemned? Because you know you're not perfect. If you're perfect, raise your hand. Larry had his almost up. There are no perfect people, right? But God put a perfect spirit inside of us to guide us and lead us. And man, it struggles, doesn't it? We wear it out. I, I had two. I was blessed. I got the Holy Spirit in me and I got a grandmother to pray for my whole life. I don't think I'd ever be a preacher if it weren't for her prayers. I think it was the double up. I think... Holy Spirit was working on me and she was just hammering away and in prayers. There's nothing that can beat the power of prayer people. And I pray that everyone here has somebody that prays for them every day, whether they know it or not. I pray for you and I, and I hope that you all are better for it. That's all I can say. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. But right now, I want to thank you for your spirit. You know, we... We're not a charismatic church here. We don't do a lot of raising the hands. We don't do a lot of Holy Ghost stuff. But you know what? Holy Ghost is still here. Holy Ghost is still working on everyone in this place. Holy Ghost is changing lives, changing hearts, changing minds, guiding people, healing people, working on them, just doing everything we need done to make us a better human, to make us a better Christian, to make us a person that God is proud of. I just ask you this morning, if anybody doesn't know you, doesn't know that great spirit that can live in you, Lord, to let it, or those who wandered off the path and they've been ignoring that spirit, Lord, let, let that spirit work on them this morning. Let it work on their lives. Let help it to change them to be who God truly called them to be, to live according to his will and his purposes so he can bless them. Because until you do that, you will not ever know blessing. Thank you, God. Thank you so much for your listening to my words this morning. And as feeble as they might be, I pray that they give you Praise and glory, because we owe everything to you.
In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand and turn to page 78. <laughs> separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 Glory be to the Father. 